Hello, everybody. My name is Joel Filderman, and welcome to the Dog Trainers Connection. I'm not a dog trainer. People you see around me are. And uh, together, they have over 150 years of knowledge and experience in the dog training world. And we get together to discuss a topic about dog training. And today's topic is going to be, should dog trainers give veterinary advice? And the reason that I came up with this topic is I heard an interesting comment the other day. And I, the, 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 top, the comment that I heard was, well, I don't think that dog trainers should give veterinary advice because uh, veterinarians uh, have gone to school and they know this and that and the other thing. And when I say veterinary advice, I'm not talking about dosage and whether a dog needs surgery or this and that and the other thing. I'm talking more about the fact of whether a dog should be on a certain food, whether uh, there's uh, something that as a dog trainer you see that you think maybe that they should go to a vet about um, or some sort of behavior thing that you think that a vet might deal with. And I'm not being 100% clear on it, but I think everybody understands what I'm saying. And um, I'm going to go to somebody who has uh, some experience this and uh, Steve, I'm gonna start with you since you're our resident vet tech. What do you think? Should dog trainers give veterinary advice? Well, I could tell you how veterinarians feel about it. <laughs> yeah, I know you know that. <laughs> and, and you're right. I mean, who has more education than they do, right? That doesn't make them infallible. And if you, you're with a client and you see a problem with the dog, then I, I, I can't imagine how a, that a veterinarian would feel poorly about getting a referral from a dog trainer so yeah, there's nothing wrong with that you, you know you see a dog you notice a limp the client didn't you might suggest that they go to the animal hospital not tell them to put the dog on something send it to the animal hospital right i mean i think most people who deal with aggression cases routinely send the dogs for physical exam and lab work before they take the case I think it's a good pairing, uh, uh, giving advice, you know, food. I mean, it used to be all right, sort of. Um, now they have board certification in veterinary nutrition. So they sort of, you know, they have a bit of a, a handle on things that they never used to be much involved with back in the day. And as a, the owner has uh, a very much a say in that the health care of their pet. So if they don't like their veterinary advice, they could go to another veterinarian, but you need medical care. So, I mean, I'm not going to go to a psychiatrist if I'm feeling physically poorly. You know, I mean, although the psychiatrist is a medical doctor and I'm sure he's skilled well enough to maybe counsel me on my physical ailment, he wouldn't be the guy. So, you know, we, we do our thing, they do their thing. Is there crossover? Yeah, there are veterinarians around where I live that still tell their clients to put the puppy on their back and hold them down, which I think is poisonous advice. They, they give it, they're educated, but I think they have an old school and inappropriate idea. Um, they may even do something medically that I might not agree with, but it's up to the client to decide if they're comfortable with their veterinarian and they're going to uh, take the advice. You know, unequivocally, they're going to take that advice. That's the way it goes. You know, so how does somebody I, else I, feel about this? I, Steve, the only God. thing I'm thinking is that if... I think trainers are dissuaded from, say their client goes to a vet, they come back and tell the trainer what they're putting the dog on or what the vet suggests. And that I think trainers nowadays are counseled that it's not your place to say, wait a minute, I don't like that advice that the vet gave. In my experience as a dog trainer and from what I've seen with other clients, maybe you should think about something else or, oh, that sounds a little dubious to me. And I think sometimes the dog trainers aren't given the credence, the, the support 
because of dog trainers that are experienced have seen a lot, have had a lot of clients that the dogs came back and either they were fine or weren't or, I mean, from the vet and maybe had more experience with food too and observing the dog more times than a vet would. So I'm kind of babbling here, but I, I think there's a general thing nowadays to a uh, general feeling to compartmentalize. This is the veterinary behaviorist. You got to send them to them. They do this. This is the vet. This is a dog trainer. This is what you do. And I think dog trainers need to be given a whole lot of credit for not going to put it. <laughs> you know? That's I agree. All. I don't think we're given enough credence for, for knowing things. Um, I don't think we should be recommending uh, medications. And I get asked that a lot <clears throat> about medications, about vaccinations. Um, I'm very careful about what I say about that. But food, food's, food is not veterinary, in my opinion. Food is not veterinary advice. So, you know, food is fair game, in my opinion. Uh, but if you're noticing something about the animal, um, I think it's perfectly appropriate to at least recommend seeing a vet. But the advice is dubious. I, you know, I mean, I've been in the situation where a client took their, happened to be a cat, uh, took their cat to the vet and they started sharing with me about the situation with the cat eating a lot, but losing weight and rattling off all these symptoms. And I just screamed in my head, you know, hypothyroidism, I lost the cat to that. So, um, and I asked what the vet said, and I forget right now what the answer was with the client, but I actually told the client, well, why don't you bring them back and ask them to check the thyroid? And they did, and the cat was put on thyroid med, and the cat improved 100%. So if I hadn't said that, that guy would have lost his cat like I did. So uh, I didn't give veterinary advice. I suggested going back to the vet and asking for further testing. I, it's fine line, um, you know, but the, I know the, vets don't like it. The vet doesn't think it's a fine line. I'm just That's... going to say that, Steve, that there, there are, and there are vets think that, and there are trainers who think that as well. There are trainers who think that that's not your business. But and look I, at if you. But, I was, but it wasn't my business, but I was right. And that guy could have lost his cat. Yeah, yeah. You know, no, I, I get it. I, but, you I'm, know, we no, have I'm experience. I'm disagreeing with you. I'm saying that, that there are people who would. You right. know? And, uh, you know, Jeff, I know you're mainly holistic. So what's your take on this? I'm twitching again. <laughs> okay. Uh -oh. <laughs> I see the steam. <laughs> so I, I've done workshops and lectures and seminars for a long time on holistic pet care. Uh, I've been practicing holistic pet care since 2002, shortly before I opened a holistic pet store. And it's the biggest challenge was the constant conflict, not with me, because I don't really care what they say. Um, but the constant conflict of suggesting certain, um, and I hate to use this word protocols, but for lack of a better word, protocols to a dog or cat owner or a bird owner, uh, and them getting resistance from the veterinarian, which I understand. Uh, and I, I, I should start with this, that anytime I, I've done a workshop lecture or seminar, I always start with, I do not prescribe, diagnose, or treat illness. <laughs> Right? I, I merely offer suggestions to support your dog's health. Uh, that's kind of how I would go about it. And now, you know, when it comes to food and stuff, you know, uh, you know, like Helen said, it's, you know, yeah, it's, it's not medical per se, but, you know, veterinarians are a one-stop shop for pet owners. So, you know, it's, it's not like we have so many different doc, human doctors, you know, I mean, I might go to a big fat primary care physician, but I'm not going to take nutrition advice from him. Mm -hmm. Right. I'm going to, I'm going to go to a nutrition doctor, right? Well, we don't always have that. Well, and nowadays it's more and more we have specialists, like you mentioned, uh, more, more and more things at our disposal. But the fact is, is that, and, and Helen suggested that, that suggestion was for the cat. 
That yeah. suggestion wasn't for Helen. So right. why the hell aren't the doctors open to that, right? But instead they get defensive. Like Helen was just, she just was concerned about the animal, right? And I think that's how, we, that's how the partnership needs to be focused on is, hey, you know what? Maybe there isn't an alternative way of dealing with this. Um, you know, and, and I've gotten a lot of flack when I was up in Jersey because, you know, I, I, I'm not even sure. I mean, we're talking maybe a thousand or more dogs and cats that I've gotten off of prescription diets, off of medications, just by changing their food and giving them a good nutrition plan. Now, granted, I have, you know, certifications in nutrition. I have a PhD in animal naturopathy. Granted, I might be a little different, but the fact of the matter is, Nowadays, vets are also contending with Dr. Google and Dr. Siri, right? <laughs> you know? So I'm, I'm sure yeah. that there might be some conflict there too. But when, it, when it's all said and done, when it comes down to the trainer veterinarian relationship, it should be a partnership and it should be about the animal. So, you know, just because the vet prescribes dry food and I recommend raw, the vet might recommend the topical shampoo and I'll recommend the fatty acid, right? You know, we have different thought processes of how we address symptoms. Yeah. You know, so I, I, mm -hmm. I think as long as our focus is on the animal, and I think as long as our focus is on speaking within the parameters of our knowledge base and not talking out of our asses, I think we're going to be okay. Um, I don't know who mentioned it. Somebody mentioned vaccines. Uh, and things that we should and shouldn't say, okay? Uh, we have a responsibility to the animal. If someone is vaccinating their animal every year and we know they shouldn't be, we better say something because if we don't, then we are not, we are not doing what's in the best interest of the animal. We are afraid of the consequences of that suggestion. And again, that all, all boils down to the benefit well-being of the animal. Yeah. No, I agree. I agree. I, I'm very careful about vaccines. I approach it from the point of view. Well, if it were my dog, I, you know, I'll tell people I'm not a vet. I'm not giving you veterinary advice. But if this were my dog, this is what I would be doing. Mm. Uh, any veterinarians watching? My name is Jeff Coltenback. If you are still, va <laughs> if you are still vaccinating animals annually. Seriously, you got a problem, okay? <laughs> they're getting away from that. I'm seeing it more and more. They run yeah. tighters. Like I know. If, if they're still doing it, it's ridiculous. I mean, they're even moving distemper shots to every three years, thank God. Yeah. Yet there's still veterinarians that are doing it every year. So. Yep. Yep. No doubt about it. Yeah. So, Joyce, let me ask you a question. Since uh, Jeff said about that he was coming from New Jersey and things, and I know that you're in Georgia, and even though I know Jeff's in North Carolina, is there any different feel to this in the South? No, we still get uh, the vets down here don't like us giving any information whatsoever, and actually getting a partnership with a veterinarian down here can be very difficult. They don't want to work with us. Um, the And when I do make recommendations, I and the vet finds out about it, I can lose any referrals I was getting from the vet. The vets are very eager to refer to me as long as I don't cross that That's what they're... Well, yeah, I write functional assessments up for all my clients. And I was doing this saying, okay, t here's two copies. Take one home, and give one to your veterinarian and keep one yourself because I want your vet to know what it is I've recommended. And 99% of the time, the vet equals either says, you don't need to see this behaviorist, you need to go to UGA and see the vet behaviorist, or they stop referring to me altogether. And it's just because I have the nerve to write a functional assessment that stated anything about what I felt the dog needed. And, mm -hmm. and how I feel about it is, like Jeff said, we're, we're, we're out there with Dr. Google and Dr. Facebook, and I see some of these people's advice, Sure. and it scares the hell out of me. And I'm like, at least I'm a competent well-experienced and highly educated dog professional. I may not be a veterinarian, but I've got close to 30 years of working with vets and working in animal shelters and training dogs and owning my own pet hotels. And so I, I, I think I've got some knowledge that's, that's valuable and it's, it's not the 
old school run of the mill crap that they're, they're given on Facebook. And, you know, it's not the confusion that you can find on Google. So, you know, I feel like we, we are of value because we can recognize things and make suggestions. The veterinarians just have to open up and see us as partners in mm. this because, you know, even coming down to, you know, when we work with dogs with anxiety and fear, you know, there's several directions you can go with that. And I, I prefer a much more natural path. Like Jeff, I'm much more in that into the holistic side of things. Um, and if you around here, if you go to a vet with that, they look at you like you've got two heads and the dog is instantly put on Prozac. That's what I was wondering. I yeah. have no control of that. I can say, you know, melatonin, 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 L theanine all day long. Mm -hmm. And they'll start out with that, but then they go see their vet and the vet goes, no, nope, Prozac. And hmm. they're, they're going to come back and be on Prozac. Right. So, you know, do I keep, you know, do I keep saying L theanine L and melatonin, what, you know, uh, CBD oil on and on, or do I go, you know, go to just go talk to your vet because I can't, my recommendations don't have any validity with them anyway so i just keep talking mm. yeah. <laughs> my suggestions and and joyce your recommendations are from the positive results that you've seen from with your clients dogs correct the ones that have taken your advice or maybe yeah. your own dogs that's how you why you would suggest that and all and the rescues that we work with I mean, we'll okay that i'm in a pit bulls i mean i have a rescue for six months to a year two years sometimes and if that's a high anxiety dog, I am doing that with them. So I see the results myself as well as with my clients. And yeah, so several. Mm -hmm. mm. <clears throat> Dennis, how about out by you on the West Coast? <clears throat> well, you know, um, luckily here, we've got some really great vets that we have a partnership with. Uh, uh, but, you know, I do agree with Jeff that and everybody that's talked that we do have to have a, uh, you know, a better relationship and really pay attention to the animal. You know, what is the dog? Is the dog telling us that this dog needs this? Um, I recently just started working with a little tripod dog, little pity mix. And th this dog was so anxiety ridden that I knew that I couldn't get my, my foot in the front door of this dog's brain. Uh, can't see a bike at over a thousand meters without completely, now this dog would vomit on itself when it saw a UPS truck. Wow. So I made the suggestion after a couple of sessions that we were not getting anywhere, no matter how much distance that we used, nothing was helping this dog. So I said, I'm going to recommend that you talk to your vet about something for this dog. So immediately, um, uh, you know, uh, the dog was put on trazodone, which I think we all know for some situations, it's a great drug. But I thought, you know, but I'm not a vet. I don't play one. You know, I've seen some really good stuff with trazodone. Then I see some really bad stuff with trazodone. But for this dog, it's working really well. Uh, that trigger has gone from 1,000 feet to maybe 20 feet within two weeks. So, and when the client sees that, they're going to be more open to listening to the vet than the trainer if they see these immediate results, even though the drug might not be a good choice, but for this dog it was. Um, mm -hmm. So, I, I think we really do, as uh, trainers and vets, we do need to pay attention to what the dog is telling us. But on the other hand, uh, recommended that a eight week old puppy be taken to a dog park to be socialized and not attend our puppy classes. Uh, we don't have a relationship with this vet. This vet, vet really doesn't know anything about us. But so this puppy has been going to a dog park for two months and now it's barking and lunching at every single dog and person that comes into the dog park. And I've been telling this person, I would love to work with you, but I can't. Um, she won't go away from the vet's advice. And even though, um, like, you know, all the experience that I have working with these dogs, I haven't been able to convince her to stop taking this puppy to the dog park. So, um, you know, I, I keep going back to this thing that Kathy Sedeo said, uh, if it doesn't bring you joy, let it go. And that's what I've done with this dog because I can't get anywhere because of the relationship that they have with this vet. So, uh, I, I think it's really important to have that relationship. 
to be able to work with somebody that understands uh, where you're coming from as a trainer and we understand where they're coming from as vets and if the animal's telling us that it's working that in my opinion is what we need to pay attention to hmm. mm. and uh let's end at east coast uh david what's your thoughts yeah i really don't have much more to add everyone's pretty much uh put some good consent in there um but I, I do agree with everybody in the sense that there should be a good relationship between the vet and the trainer um for instance, I have some brochures from a lot of my, my vets, and there's that relationship where they allow me to, to work with them and, and work with, with some of their clients. I get a lot of people that, that they come in and see, see them, and then they refer me out. But there's not really that relationship where it's, um, you know, they're recommend, you know, they're, they're saying, David, what do you think about, you know, the vet's not saying, David, you know, I'm mm -hmm. telling you so-and-so, uh, you know, I suggested this kind of uh, vaccine or this kind of this or this kind of that. You know, please, you know, follow up on that or, or vice versa. It, it's not that kind of relationship, which I, I kind of wish it was. But mm -hmm. with that said, I, I do feel that, you know, I don't like to uh, put my nose where it doesn't belong um, and give out medical advice. But, you know, like everyone has mentioned, like Steve and Helen and, and Jeff and so forth, I, I do feel that it's, it's important just to say that, you know, um, from, what, from my experience, what I've seen or what I've read, um, this is kind of what the way I'm leaning, what it looks like in your, your dog situation. So please speak to your vet about X, Y, Z. And mm -hmm. if the vet is not really on board with that, uh, um, then maybe like someone, I don't know who would mention it, seek the advice of another vet because there's something that doesn't sound right. If it's, if it's way out of whack, you know, if, if they, they can kind of see it, but they're like, no, I don't think it's that. We ruled that out. That's a, diff that's a different story. Mm -hmm. uh, and the other thing where I explain to my, my clients as well is, um, you know, I'm not just coming shooting from my butt. You know, I, I get information from other vets that I don't have any relationship whatsoever with. For instance, from newsletters, from the Dog Watch, uh, Whole Dog Journal, from Your Dog, Tufts University, Cornell. So these are great practices. They're from the top uh, schools of veterinary practice. So even if they don't agree with what I'm suggesting, they should at least be able to, to relate to it and, and, and so forth. Um, so I explain to them that it's coming from a veterinary uh uh, you know, from their, from their point of view, what have you. And obviously, I, you know, this vet doesn't know your, your dog situation, but it, it sounds like it might be this kind of, 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 um, of a problem that the dog is experiencing and to, to run, you know, run these things for your vet. So uh, I, I think that, that's, you know, pretty important to do. Can I, can, I, can I end on one quick thing? I know Go right ahead. Down. I guess I was, that's not where we're going to end. Go I want to say something quick too. Um, me too. Me three. This is, this is for pet owners who happen to be watching this. And, you know, I, I tell people this all the time. For you pet owners watching, you have to be the champion for your pet. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and I'm, you know, whether it's one of us or your trainer or your vet or whomever giving you advice, if you're uncomfortable with that advice and you want to do something contrary to what they're suggesting, that is your responsibility. Okay. It's, if you go to a vet it's your pet, it's your dollar, it's your visit, mm -hmm. okay? Take charge of it. Be the champion for your animal, okay? Sure. And, and granted, we're gonna do the best we can to help support you, but at the end of the day, it's your responsibility to stand up and do what you feel is right for your animal and your situation. Yeah. Alan? Exactly. Um, don't just, I love when, when a client challenges me asks me why or you know questions me don't just take the advice on on face value if, if you're if your vet or anyone tells you something and it doesn't seem right or you're not sure about it question it ask why you know puppy can't go to puppy classes why not what's going to happen mm -hmm. what will happen if i take my puppy to class at you know oh he might get sick how is he going to get sick from what from where you know question it and also for pet owners out there a lot of times as somebody else mentioned this their relationship with the trainer is a little more intimate i think than with the vet the the dog goes for wellness visits after the initial round of vaccinations and whatnot unless the dog is sick they show up at the vet once a year um but they'll see your trainer more often. So a lot of times we have more history. We have more background. We know more about the dog to begin with. 
So, I mean, I, I've run into a few situations where the advice of the vet was, sorry, I hate to say it, but incorrect. <laughs> I had a dog getting hot spots and they, um, the vet wanted to put them on prescription. Oh, it's got allergies, prescription foods, and we're going to give them shots, allergy shots. And I was talking with my client and I knew they took the dog to the beach and then I found out they weren't rinsing the dog afterwards. Mm. Salt water left to dry on the dog will create hot spots. So I, told, I suggested make sure you shampoo or hose down your dog thoroughly after swimming in the ocean. <laughs> hot spots went away. Mm. No more hot spots. You know, things like that. But the vet didn't know that they took the dog to the beach. So why would they even think to ask that? You know, right away, they see a medical issue. And most of the time, it probably is. But in that case, it was just, you know, they weren't rinsing the dog. Bonnie, you want to say something? Yeah, I just two quick things. One, um, clients speaking to their vets and trainers may be reaching out to vets. It doesn't matter if it's a holistic vet or a regular Western medicine trained vet because I've reached out to a holistic vet that I didn't think was doing right that I had referred my client to. So I think the whole thing, uh, though he talked to me and I had a good talk with him, I think Dog Trainers Connection, you know, my business, I'd like to try to do something to hold a live conference or an online talk and get vets here with us to, 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 to work this out better so that there aren't those negative feelings back and forth about who knows what and who's qualified to say Good idea. That. Thank you. I'd love Thanks, to be involved. Yeah. Yep. Good idea. Thank you. you. You'd have to be, we'd have to rein you in. No, I'll be nice. No, I know. I know. I know. I'm just kidding you. Anybody want to add anything real quick? Steve did. Well, I had two interesting cases that sort of apply here. Um, one was a, an, a young adult greater Swiss mountain dog that the lady said she couldn't get housebroken. So she brings me the dog and she describes incontinence. When the dog's lying down and relaxed, she wakes up wet. Mm -hmm. I'm like, okay. Have you been to the vet? Yes. Did they do a urinalysis? Yes. Okay. How many times have you been on and the dog had an infection? Oh, they said it was a mild infection. They gave me antibiotics. Um, okay. Didn't go away. Have you, did you go back to your vet? Yes, I did. How many times? Oh, probably about 10 times now. Jeez. Whoa. Uh -huh. Antibiotic overload. So I have to excuse myself for going to another room and call a veterinarian that I know to find out how much trouble I'm gonna be in when I suggest to this woman that she mm. needs to go somewhere else. Wow. And so I was told that, um, especially since the client wasn't referred by the veterinarian that's been treating this case, he said, no problem. And I did, and the dog had a whopping terrible infection and got treated and was fine. Mm. So. You know, sometimes, it, and it's true, I could lose my license. You know, I mean, in veterinary technology, it's a little, I could get sued. You know, getting that license, like, put me in a certain spot that I got to be a little bit careful. But I asked somebody, can I do this? And they said, yeah, absolutely, and should. And I did, and it worked out. And the other one was a young Labrador in a class that when I tried to get the dog to sit, it had a grimace on its face. And I'm like, I'm not going to make this dog sit. It looks uncomfortable. Mm. Down wasn't so bad, but sit didn't want, you know, and I wasn't going to force it. So I say to her, maybe you should go to the vet and, you know, have him examine this dog and stuff. You know, the dog is stiff in the rear and it won't sit and I'm not going to make it. So maybe you got to go get it checked out. So she goes to the vet and she says, Steve Diller said, maybe you should get some x-rays just to take a look and see if everything's okay. And the vet said, Steve Diller is not an, a veterinarian. And we don't x-ray Labrador hips until the dog's two years old. Oh, and really? the lady comes back and tells me that. And I say, ma'am, <laughs> I'm not looking for OFA x-rays here. I'm looking for architecture, you know, is, uh, uh, how do they look, right? But he wouldn't do it. 
I get a phone call from her like four and a half months later. She's way past class and all that. And she calls me up and she says, when the dog started to limp recently, we took the dog to the vet and he x-rayed my dog who has crippling hip dysplasia. Oh, it wasn't any less crippling when I asked her to go get it. Yeah. But he had a perception and he instantly jumped on. This guy's not a veterinarian and I'm not doing it. First. And so there you go. So it's an interesting, you know, look, we can know or think and we can send. And if they don't hear, then the client, you know, Jeff, what are you going to do? You know, what are you going to do? That if they're going to, if they listen to the client, right? Well, Helen says, you know, you know what are you going to do? I mean, it's tough. We can, you can try, you can interfere a little bit, but if you send them to the vet, you do, you, you, I think it's the right protocol if we're going to use that word. It's like, if you got a medical, you think you got a medical issue, send them to the vet. You know, they, they may not get it right. I mean, what about in the old days, those lick granulomas that they used to always make, right? They would lick and lick. And we used to shave them, wash them, inject them with a the steroid and send them home on antibiotics and steroids. Or you bandage it. Then they lick the other leg. It was never considered... <laughs> that it might be a behavioral issue in the first place, mm -hmm. right? It was always, it was a bug bite, it was an injury. I mean, I, I know the rap, you know, but it wasn't correct. They just, they didn't consider it. I mean, things are a little better now, you know? I think we're better in what we do. I mean, we're all experienced. There are young trainers, they don't have this experience at all. And they still might try to give the advice. And then where does that put your client? You know, does that client's going to listen to some kid who thinks they know and they don't, you know, so I get where the vet says at least, you know, well, you know, I, I went to Cornell, you know, I have a paper here. That's, that says, is a good point. There's something there. And if it doesn't work out because they don't, or they're not all that open-minded or you know, some vets are less experienced than others. What about the young vets? Yeah. Are they expected to have the same, like, you know, masterful, like, like ideas that some of these old guys, like, you know, I've been impressed by some of the old guys over the years where they do cool stuff, you know, take blood from cats with nobody holding them. You know, I, I've worked with vets like that, old guys, you know, stick a needle in their jug, there's nobody holding them. They just go and stick the head up, boom. You know, where these days you got a technician, most of them like <laughs> that, you know, and the cat's freaking out. And, you know, some of these old guys, I mean, they're like farmers, but they had yep. some stuff going on, you know. <laughs> so it, there's, there's a, a big gap between some of us and some of the people in our business, and there's a big gap for some of them and some of the people in their business. And, and I'm sure they would agree on that. They're not all the same, just like we're not all the same. Mm -hmm. And that seems like a good place to stop. And um, I'd like to thank everybody for being here. I'd like to thank everybody for watching. And uh, we'll see you on the next one. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye now. Bye. Bye.